the Bureau of Justice comes out with statistics. And in their statistics, they have studied that there is a high rate of people returning to prison once they're released. They did a study that tracked 404,638 prisoners in some 30 states after their release from prison. Here's what their study found. Within three years of release, about two-thirds, 67.8% of them released, were rearrested. Within five years of release, about three-quarters, which was 76.6% of released prisoners were arrested. Of those prisoners who were rearrested, more than half, 56.7%, were arrested by the end of the first year. Property offenders were the most likely to be rearrested with 82.1% of the released being rearrested. We look at statistics like that and we think, bless their heart. They, they just, they can't get out of it. You know, once you have a prisoner, they're just going to be a prisoner their whole life. You read statistics like this and you think, idiots. Until we read a book like Galatians. And then we have to be very careful when we throw stones. I'm going to invite you to turn to Galatians 5. We've been going through Galatians 5 recently. And this morning we've come to verses 13 through 15. And I want us to park here for just a moment. I'm going to read these verses. You please follow along. Galatians 5, 13 through 15. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. God, I I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for reminding us of freedom. And I pray that this morning we would be challenged not to turn back to the old life. You've told us that your word is living and active, is sharper than a double-edged sword. And that it won't return void when it goes out. So my prayer this morning, Lord, is as we read this text, as we study this text, you would do something with it that I cannot do in my own strength. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell you just a summary of where this text is and where we're headed. The, the, The basic thesis of this message is that God says the call to freedom isn't a license for flesh, but it's a platform to serve in love. And I want us to begin at verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. We'll just pause right there. The first thing we notice in this text is that there is a God-given call to freedom. As I was preparing for this message, I I went online just to watch some YouTube videos of what it looks like when someone is released from prison. Now, several of the videos I can't show you in here because not all ex-cons are sanctified saints and their language on YouTube lacks a a lot and so we're not going to watch it but just let it be said there there's many people who go absolutely nuts 
when they're finally released from prison. There was one guy that I saw who had been wrongly convicted 30 years ago and he had been on death row. And when he came out, he was stupefied at the freedom that he had. Just blown away. He said, I can't, I can't imagine being able to look out and see the sky without bars. Because the, these folks had been set free. Paul begins this 13th verse of chapter 5 by saying, You have been called to freedom. You are called to freedom. And stopping right there, I want us to remember this morning that you and I have been called to freedom. That's what happened at the cross. Let me just give you a brief summary statement. You and I were sin slaves. We came into this world not wanting it, not asking for it, but born into sin slavery. No one has to tell a little kid, you know what, you need to learn the word no or mine. You don't have to teach that. It comes naturally. This sin slavery, Bible says, it is because of our father, the devil. And it also says that the devil has plans to steal, kill, and destroy every single one of us. So when your life is messed up, that's part of your father's plan, the devil, to completely ruin everything you are and have. And there's nothing you and I can do about it. We, we can't fix our problem. We come into this world completely helpless to fix our own sin problem. And God knew that. He knew that there's no way that we could offer a covering for ourselves. So he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he was the Lamb of God, which meant, and it's a reference to the Old Testament, where a lamb was slaughtered, the blood was put over the doorpost, and if, that, if the death angel saw the blood, he would pass by. And because of the blood of Jesus on the cross, those of us who accept Christ and his sacrifice for us that blood has been applied to our heart, and when the Father looks at us, he doesn't see that sin scarred. He looks at the blood and says he's forgiven. You see, here's what happens. We've traded Jesus, our sins, for his righteousness. That is an amazing trade. You got the righteousness of Christ and he got our sins because there's some in this room today who probably have played the game Christian maybe you've never really heard what Jesus did for you either way you sit here still condemned John 3 says that if you if you have not been born again you you remain or you abide in your sins, you're, you're, you're on death row. I say this because Jesus calls out to you that you can be free. I had not planned this, but I, I want to do something. Um, Brother Kelvin, would you bring your team back up here? Um, and, and would you pull up at the cross again? See, a lot of times we sing songs, as Mark said, and we just kind of go through. But my guess is if you're sitting here today and you have never been forgiven because of Jesus Christ, there is something on the inside of you that's eating you to pieces. And you know you need Jesus. And he is calling out to you, and I don't want you to wait another moment I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to sing through this song again 
if our deacons would come down here, Tommy, if you would come down here and stand in the front to receive people who may want to talk to these men about Jesus Christ and following him. It's time for an invitation right now for those who need Jesus Christ. He is calling you and it is time for you to give your life to him. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in. sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Jesus There's a place where sin and shame are powerless with God and forgiveness for all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you, where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, here my hope is found, here on holy ground, here I bow. wide here you say my life here I bow down here I bow at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you, I owe all to you, do it again, at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life, I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you, where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, Jesus. Just bow your heads if you would, just continue to respond to him.
the cross, everything is made new. God, help us not to take it for granted. So many of us in this room have followed you our whole lives. It's been years and years since we knew what it was like to be lost. Father, your word tells us that that's who we were. And apart from grace and mercy, judgment was on us too. Father, forgive us for becoming so complacent in the cross that it's nothing more than just lyrics in a song. Father, your word tells us that it's the gospel that changes the lives of people. That good news. And my prayer, God, is that we as a church family would remember what it was like the day you called us to yourself. And for those who are still in prison, God, I'm asking that you would continue to call on them. Don't give them over to themselves yet. But Lord, please continue to put Christ in front of them so that at some point in life, they'll realize that there is no hope apart from Jesus. God, please let us as a church never become so familiar with the cross that it loses its power and effectiveness in our life. I pray that that the cross would get bigger and bigger and bigger the closer to home we get. I ask in Jesus' name. for those of us in this room who have decided to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Verse 13 has something for us as well because Paul had to write this again to a group of churches. And in verse 13, he says, not only were we called to freedom, brethren, but do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. This freedom that we have, this freedom is not a license to let my flesh go wild. I don't know what all was going on in the churches in Galatia. My guess is somehow, some way, they kind of took on the attitude of the, the Corinthian church. And that Corinthian church, when they came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they thought, great, we are in his grace. Now we have permission to do whatever we want. We're his. Now I can behave in freedom and enjoy this freedom even if it disobeys our Lord. I want to read to you what Romans chapter 6 says. Turn to Romans 6. Some of you probably already know what's going to be said. And I hope that that's the Holy Spirit within you quickening to truth. Romans chapter 6. I want to read verses 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. 
For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, please jump down to verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you were committed And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Here's here's a visual of the condition Jesus found me in whenever I was born. It says that I was a slave to sin. Guys, I don't know about you, but this is not how I often look at my sinful life. When I think about my sin, I often think, well, that's a whole lot of fun until I get caught. Or for many of you who are like me, I was seven when I gave my life to Jesus. I don't see my life before Christ as that of a a homegrown thug. That's exactly what Jesus says I was spiritually. Bound in my sin at seven years old. Couldn't do anything for myself. Jesus came along. Randall, aren't you glad people don't have handcuffs that easy to get out of? Jesus came and he freed me. But did you hear what the book of Romans said? The book of Romans says that we are now slaves to righteousness. Kaz, here's what blows my mind. The cuffs are always there. The question is, who am I cuffed to? The enemy or my heavenly father? I'm either a slave to sin or I'm a slave to righteousness. Do you realize the book of Romans doesn't say there's a choice C? Choice C, what we're hoping is that I am a slave to however much fun I can have here and still get to heaven. That's not a choice in the book of Romans. I'm either a slave to sin or I'm a slave to righteousness, which means you are a slave to sin or you are a slave to righteousness. And the option of living our old life isn't available. I can't say I'm saved by grace and I live my old life. That's not an option, which means we're either in need of salvation or we need to drop the way of life that we used to have. Look again at Galatians 13. 
He says, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Guys, one of the things that we, again, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, the one of the things that we have hidden by for so long is once saved, always saved, which, which is the Baptist term for I can act however I want to act now. How do I know that's true? I'll go and poll the waitresses around town and ask them how we as Christians behave. And statistically speaking, we stink. We'll ask the people at the places of business around here if they hear us as followers of Christ speaking to them as though it is Christ himself speaking to them. Or do we speak to people in our community out of our flesh? And this text says our freedom is not a righteousness, uh, is not an, uh, a license to act however we want to act. Guys, I want to just read a very small part of a book. This is by Tom Rainer. Uh, he's... He's over Lifeway, okay? So if you don't like this, deal with Lifeway. This book is called An Autopsy of Deceased Church. They went around to different believers who, who used to be part of churches, and the church quite literally does not exist anymore. It dissolved because it was dead. And he interviewed these people and he, he grouped different things that killed the church. In this particular chapter of, of why churches died, chapter 7, the preference-driven church. Every one of the 14 autopsy churches had some level of this problem before they died. A significant number of the members move the focus from others to themselves. And when a church moves in that direction, it is headed for decline and death. The decline may be protracted and the death may be delayed, but it is inevitable. The church will die. A church cannot survive long term where its members are focused on their own preferences. My music style, my desired length and order of worship service, my desired color and design of the buildings and rooms, my activities and programs, my need for ministers and staff, my, my, my. A church by definition is a body of believers who function for a greater good of the congregation. In essence, when church members increasingly demand their own preferences, the church is steadily not becoming the church. It is therefore neither surprising nor unexpected, at least from an observer's point of view, when the church closes its doors. The church really died before then because its members refused to be the church. I'm just telling you, Paul saw something in the churches throughout Galatia, and he said, you guys cannot let your freedom be an opportunity for you to fulfill your own fleshly desires. Here's the question that we're left with here. How have you abused your freedom How have you abused it? What are you clinging to that fulfills your flesh rather than the freedom to follow Jesus? What's got you back in the set of handcuffs as its own prisoner? The text goes on. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The text says that our freedom is to be used for expressing Christ's love, not eating each other alive. 
Our freedom is to be used for expressing Christ's love, not eating each other alive. I want to go to another book. This is Mark Buchanan's book, Your Church is Too Safe. Some of you have heard me read this section. I encourage you to listen again. It says, And now I resolve the matter for all time. It doesn't matter. The kingdom is not about any of this. The kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking or music styles or how up to date or out of date we are. The kingdom of God is a republic of love. Not the sentimental, sensual thing that the world calls love, but 1 Corinthians 13 kind. Fierce, wild, huge, feisty, pure. It's unbounding extravagance at the heart of the heart of God. This love is the song God sings over us and calls us to sing loudly. What makes the church both a mystery and magnet to the world is when we love in this way, God's way. This love makes us relevant. Its absence makes us irrelevant, regardless of whatever else we're doing. And then he poses a question. Please listen to me with both ears. Question. Is the love in your church such that the people in the world and of the world would be willing to forsake all other loves just to know this love? Let me personalize that statement. Is the love at First Baptist Church in Hohenwald, Tennessee, such that people in Hohenwald and Lewis County would be willing to forsake all other loves just to know the kind of love that happens here? Would they give up all their addictions their diversions, their compromises, their resentments, because the love of the church that the church has is better and truer and deeper than anything they found anywhere else. If yes, your church is relevant to the world. If no, it is irrelevant. So basically the question is this, do the people out there see a love in here that they could never get from someone or some place, and they cannot help but to come here saying, you guys have love the right way. And if, if the world doesn't see that here, then we are irrelevant regardless of what we see ourselves as. For the whole law is fulfilled in this one word, love your neighbors as yourself. Now, I struggled with 14 and 15 because it doesn't quite make sense. Even if you look in the original language, there's some wording that's a little bit weird. And in the English, it sounds weird in 15. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're You're not consumed by one another. uh, You're not consumed. Verse 15 sounds a whole lot to me like a parent. Now, I didn't have three boys, okay? So just imagine if you've got three boys in the house. And you say, boys, in this house, we do not fight. We don't punch. We don't scratch. We don't kick. And verse 15 would be like, knowing that that's the house rules. But then I say, if you're going to punch and kick and scratch, make sure you don't get blood on the floor. Because guess what? As a dad, I would know that there's going to be some kicking and scratching and punching. But we draw the line at getting blood on the floor. I don't want there to be fighting. How do I know that this is the way that Paul views verse 15? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. He's encouraging them to love their neighbor as their self. 
But Galatians 3 verse 1, I wish I could, I wish I could read this with the same indignant passion that Paul wrote this. But he says, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? This is Greek New Testament for you're an idiot. Now, does that sound like what we want to have people say to us? Paul said, listen, there are factions going on because some people are following Paul, some people are following Peter, some people are following James, and you've got some Judaizers in the church, and you've got some people who really do want to follow Christ, and he says, I don't want there to be bickering and fighting. But need be, I'll jump in the middle of this and I'll call you out on your bad theology. And that's what he does in chapter 3, verse 1. And he says, I don't want this. I don't want you to use your liberty, your freedoms to bite each other and to hound each other. But he also goes on to say, but if you do, let me tell you where it's going to end up. It's going to end up with you being consumed. And then the next thing you know, someone writes a book about how First Baptist Church, Hohenwald, Tennessee, is a deceased church. He said, I don't want you to use the fact that you're saved as a platform to go around biting and bickering and fighting. I want you to use it as a platform of service. Now, I will say there is a time and a place for correction. Here's the great part about this. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That word for love is agape. God love. Christ kind of love. Was Christ loving? You bet he was. Did you want to be on the end of his correction stick when you, at the temple of the day that the people were changing money and not letting folks worship? Oh, <laughs> oh, he loved those people. He loved them so much that he drove them out of there. Question. At this point in life, right now, who needs to be the object of, of agape love? Who needs to be the one that you see and you say, it is now my mission to serve them, not bite them? Is there someone that you have in your jaws And you know it because every time you say something, there's biting remarks. Now, I want to go ahead and just add this little commentary. It may not be somebody sitting in here. Sometimes those people that we have this kind of issue with is family, and they may not even live here. Sometimes we treat each other in this room a whole lot better than we even treat family. And this text says, use what Jesus did in you there as a platform to serve in love. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what Paul had to tell this church and these churches in Galatia. Father, I'm thankful that you give reminders not to go back to the old life. Because God, I confess, it is so easy to do things in the flesh. I thank you for warnings not to do that. I do pray for our church right now that we would be the kind of people who love others as you love them. And that we would love others 
the way we really do love ourselves. I ask that you would forgive me and forgive us for putting self as number one often. God, the way we spend our money and the way we spend our time and the way we talk to each other is not always what verse 14 shows. I pray that you would align our hearts with the fact that we confess you as our Lord. We need you, and we need you now. I pray in Jesus' name.